Welcome to Glioblastoma, aka GBM, a podcast brought to you by the Glioblastoma Research Organization, highlighting stories of GBM warriors, caregivers, medical advisors, and more. Join us this season as we connect with members of our incredible community and have meaningful and insightful chats regarding all things glioblastoma. Please note that any information provided on the show is not meant to treat, diagnose, or prevent any disease, and all information that is discussed in our conversation is what worked for the individual themselves and should not be taken as advice. The information provided on this show is not a substitute for professional medical advice, and you should contact your medical provider and healthcare team with any questions. Barbie Blankova, welcome to glioblastoma, a.k.a. GBM. Thank you, Amber. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to have you on the show. I know we've been talking for like years on Instagram Mm -hmm. and we have very similar stories. So I'm excited for you to share yours. Yeah. But before we get into it, I'm curious, you know, I want to talk a little bit about your background. You were super into gymnastics and cheerleading as a kid and then you were participating in WWE. How did you get into that? Let's (laughs) let's talk about it. It's a wild story. (laughs) Um, I never thought I was going to become a wrestler, number Mm -hmm. one. Um, You know, and it's crazy because it's something that I used to watch with my dad. Mm -hmm. Like that was our thing. When I was like 13, 14, I was so into wrestling and my dad loved it. And my mom was like so against it. Mm -hmm. So whenever I would go to my dad's house, that was like our thing we would watch. And my mom would get so mad. She's like, did you watch wrestling? She just hated the violence and everything about it. And, you know, I was like, yeah, we watched it. She would like get so mad at my dad. But it was like that was our bonding time. And it was so cool um, to have that together. And yeah, I mean, I was a gymnast. I started doing gymnastics at three years old and I competed at like six years old. Wow. Um, And I loved it. And then I ended up like breaking my tailbone in a crazy accident. (laughs) And I was just like, that's done. My dreams of the Olympics are over, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know. And then I got into competitive cheerleading at like 12 years old. And I love that. And yeah, I mean, I was always into like entertainment and like performing, Mm -hmm. obviously. And then I started um, when I graduated high school, I started doing like bikini modeling for like Hawaiian tropics. This Mm -hmm. is like the big thing back in the day. Um, And my mom and my parents were super supportive, which was so funny because, you know, you have to strut out in a bikini and stuff. But, Mm -hmm. you know, they were cool. They would come cheer me on and stuff. So one day I was in a Venus swimwear catalog, which is like you're from Florida. You know, I don't Mm -hmm. know if you remember the Venus catalogs. Um, The like talent person who like found talent was they were looking for models that they could train to wrestle and they saw my picture and a catalog and they called my agent and my agent called me and he's like so I have this crazy um like job Mm -hmm. and I was like what he's like do you want to become like a wrestler? I was like, what? I mean, you're like, what? dad, guess what just yeah. happened? Yeah. Oh my God. It was wild. The phone call after to my dad was so crazy. So, well, when he called, I was actually going to school for broadcast journalism because mm. I was like, oh, I want to be an anchor woman. Like, that could be fun. Um, it's actually but I, so funny. Like, when I was a kid, my parents were like, you need to be like an anchor. Yeah. Like, like, it's really funny <laughs> you say that. And it was just so fun. Like, I was like, oh, this could be easy. And I hated school. Mm-hmm. So I was like, well, this will, you know, we'll get my little bachelor's degree. <laughs> be fine. Mm-hmm. And so six months in, yeah, that's when I got the phone call. And I remember I called my mom and my dad. And I was like, so, you know, I have to go and like I would have to try out and it'd be like a week. And then if I got, you know, hired, I'd have to move away. Mm-hmm. And they were, my mom, of course, is like, you know, kind of hesitant. My dad was like, oh, my God, yes. Like college will always be there. This is so cool. I like, love a supportive coach. father. Oh, yeah. He was like, <laughs> my number one fan. And so I tried out. They hired me and I had to move to Louisville, Kentucky mm-hmm. at 19 years old. I was the youngest female still um, to ever be hired by wow. WWE, which was wild. Yeah. And I moved away. I've never been without my family. Like it was, I lived with another girl from Jacksonville and we both were like so young, so naive, like mm-hmm. didn't know what we were getting ourselves into. But I was so lucky. Like, you know, I started training a few months in and I got a phone call and they were like, we have a, we have a position for you on the show. Wow! And I got brought up and the rest is history. How did the name Kelly Kelly come about? You know, so I never even really knew. Like, they gave me a list of names because they were like, you can't keep Barbie okay. because it's trademarked, right? I was like, okay. And they were like, but we'll give you a list of names mm-hmm. and you pick through the names. So I liked Kelly. I was like, there was Barbie had a Kelly friend, I think. So mm-hmm. I was like, that's cute. 
And then Vince saw the name and he was like, what about Kelly Kelly? I was like, okay, like, I like that. Mm -hmm. But come to find out, there's like (laughs) the show Cheers, you know, Mm -hmm. back in the day. The bartender's name, her name was Kelly, and she had a song. I guess it it was like Kelly, Kelly, I don't know. So that's where I guess it originated from. Amazing. Yeah. And so what was the call like with your dad when you got that offer? Oh, my gosh. He was like... (laughs) No way. Like, this is insane. Like, and my like, dreams are coming true. It was so cra- Like, it was just so, cra- like, so full circle of, like, watching it with him and, like, seeing these women who were, like, beautiful. And back in the day, it wasn't like they were wrestling wrestling. It was, like, more models, mm-hmm. you know, and stuff like that. And I was like, oh, that could be so cool. But never in a million years did I think oh, I'm going to become that, you mm-hmm. know. And so, yeah, he was just like, you have to do this. You have to, like, try out if it doesn't work out. But at least you tried. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, I remember I debuted and he was just like, the, like, I watched every week, like, was at oh. every show he could be at. Like, it was just the coolest thing. That's so fun. It's so nice to have that support, especially. It's so cool, too, because that was something that... You mentioned that he was super mm-hmm. like involved and you guys used to watch it. So it kind of really did come full circle. Yeah. Love that. <laughs> and so, you know, leading into your dad's, obviously your dad was diagnosed with glioblastoma. Mm-hmm. Like, what was that like? Were you involved? Were you there? How did that all happen? You know, it's the like, story is just so wild. Um, and it came out of nowhere. Like mm-hmm. it literally, my aunt passed away of cancer. She had breast cancer and then it, you know, came went into her stomach and it, it kind of took her right away and mm-hmm. my dad and my aunt were like this and I remember after she had passed it was really hard for him and he was like I want to move to Vegas like so my sister lives in Vegas and mm-hmm. my dad and my sister were like this mm-hmm. um and they lived together in Miami and he was and she moved to Vegas and he was like I'm gonna move to Vegas and I want to be closer because I was in LA and she was in Vegas and so you know he moved to Vegas and Oh, they um, like bought an apartment um, like right next to each other. And my sister was like, this was in December. She's like, dad's acting like kind of weird. This is December 2018. Okay. No, 2017. 2017. So he was just acting weird. Like he would like call my sister thinking it was me. He would text me thinking it was my sister Mm -hmm. and like would ask these weird things. And I was like, what's going on? And she was seeing him on a daily basis. Like I was only talking to him on the phone and like seeing him occasionally, but she was seeing him every day. You were still on the show at this time? I was still on the show. Okay. We were still recording. So I was like working and stuff. And so I wasn't able to be out there as much as, you know, obviously she lived there. Mm -hmm. She would call me and she's like, I think I'm going to take him to the emergency room. Like, Mm -hmm. I feel like he needs to get tests done. I don't know. He's sleeping a lot. Like, it's just like weird. And I was like, okay, take him to the doctor. She took him in. They were like, he's fine. He just needs fluids and needs to rest. Mm -hmm. We're like, okay. So a few weeks go by. Now we're at the end of December. My sister's like, you need to cut, you need to come here. Like you need to get here. I want, like, I can't do this alone. Mm -hmm. It's like, I'm doing this every day. And like, you know, so we go, I fly there. We take him into the hospital emergency room and they're like, we're going to keep him overnight. Like we we want to do some more tests. So you stay there for a few days and they've come to the, so a matter of like literally probably four days he's been there Mm -hmm. and he's already declining Mm -hmm. like a night and day. Like, it's not talking really, like, not really moving. And we're like, what? And so they're like, we think he has muscular dementia. Mm -hmm. And we're like, okay, well, what does that mean? They're like, well, we're going to move him to a facility, try and, like, you know, practice movements and get him moving again and all that. And we're like, all right. So they move him to the facility. And again, I'm still working, Mm -hmm. you know, and my sister's there. She's there. I mean, I don't know how we could have done it without her. Like, she literally was, like, advocating for him every day, fighting with doctors. And I was, it's so frustrating because I couldn't be there. Mm -hmm. So thank God for her, you know, fighting with them. And she's like, something's going on. She's like, I feel like something's happening in his brain. Mm -hmm. Like, it's just not, he's not there. I remember I had, I flew, I had a, I got asked to do the Royal Rumble. And I was like, Mary, you know, make sure he's watching, like, you know, she, so they have it turned on and he's at the point where he is not functioning at all. He's literally, he can blink, but like cannot move, can't write, can't like, 
And I remember I went to the Rumble. I came to the hospital as soon as I got done. And he's in a wheelchair and he's just like, like a vegetable. And I'm mm-hmm. like, what is happening? Like, and so I remember I saw, I ran into the, and I was like, something is going on. Like, why won't you guys do a, like a brain biopsy? And it's so frustrating because this healthcare in Vegas mm-hmm. is so bad. And I hate to like, you know, talk bad about but it's just so bad and I remember them being like we don't have the tools to go like we need him to go to LA like UCLA like they have a I'm like we can't he'll pass away Mm -hmm. like we can't do that and I just remember that they were like you need to start looking at like facilities like homes where like where they go to pass basically my uncle came out who is my aunt's husband and he went and helped us you know so our family started coming out to see him themselves because they were like what's happening like what is going on because it's just me and my sister my sister is 28 Mm -hmm. at the time i'm 30 and like we are just we my mom's not there like nobody's here Mm -hmm. so we don't know all we're seeing is my dad being going in fine and now two weeks later he's a vegetable and so we started looking at homes and I'm like no this isn't (laughs) this is not how he's supposed to die like this is not something we we're not having the answers Mm -hmm. that we need to get so we went in and we're like you need to send him to a hospital like another facility we're not gonna let you put him in a home we're not gonna do it and they were like fine so they Because we started, we were like, we will sue. We were like, we were just like at the point where we were like, we will sue you guys. We'll do whatever we got to do. So they sent him to another hospital. Then they started to say he had Parkinson's. Really? (laughs) Have part, you know what I mean? So finally, now it's been a month and a half. They're like, we'll do the brain biopsy. We're like, thank God, you know, hopefully we'll get some answers. So they go in, we do the brain biopsy. And they're like, He's got glioblastoma. It's like, they're like, it's so bad. Mm -hmm. Like it is everywhere. And I didn't know, like, sorry, (laughs) Um, the severity of glioblastoma. I had no idea about glioblastoma. It's not a cancer that's talked about, a cancer that's known. It's so rare. And they were like, you know, the statistics of living long is not, (laughs) you know, they were like, we can cover we can do chemo, um, you know, try and take out as much as possible. But like the cancer was pushing and that's why it made sense because the, the cancer was pushing on all of the, the motor functions. Mm-hmm. And that's why, you know, he deteriorated so fast. And they were like, in 24 hours, we can do this or we can take out and we'll see his quality of life. So they did it. There was no nothing. You know, they were like. You have, you know, a few, we don't know, you know, you could have a few weeks, a few days. So they took him out of surgery and, you There's know. some tissues there. If you no, want. thank you. <laughs> well, we were at the hospital. This is the day after. And the nurses were amazing and the, the people at the hospital were very good to us. And they said, look, we you've been in here every day. You guys should go for like a night getaway. Like your dad's not going anywhere. We promise. Like he's going to be okay. You mm-hmm. go, you guys have. This is just not good to be yeah. here and to be doing this every day and you guys need a little break. So I talked to my sister and she was like, let's go to L.A. for a night. Like they're giving us the OK. We've been here for now two weeks straight and I needed to get home to take care of some stuff. So it's like, OK, and they reassured us. They were like, he's going to be fine. He's not mm-hmm. going. He's not going to pass. We literally. And this is the thing about my dad. Like he never wanted us to see him in pain. He never wanted us to like see him like that so I think it was really hard for him to for us to see him like that you know so I think it was like he waited for us to leave and the next morning we get a call my sister gets a call at 5 a.m they're like you need to come you need to come back he's got pneumonia Mm -hmm. in both lungs and like he's gonna go I was the one because so I found his will and because I was going through paperwork and I found the will and he didn't want to be resuscitated he didn't he just wanted to go right and I was gonna have to be the one to do it and so I knew that and so my sister's like okay I'm gonna get on the flight I have like I'm gonna get there I was like okay I can get there and like I just give me like an hour I'll get on the next flight my sister calls me and she's like you have to get here now like he's not gonna last I'm like oh my god so I'm like 
I'm rushing, I'm packing my stuff and I get on the plane and my girlfriends came over to my house and they drove me because I was like, I can't move. Mm -hmm. It's like, I can't do this. I can't make this decision. They were like, you have to, you know, get on the plane. So I got to the hospital and, you know, he, it was like he waited. Mm -hmm. He waited for me to get there. And so we, you know, we laid there with him. He loved Tom Petty. That was like, you know, so we played Tom Petty. We played the Beatles and we just kind of laid there with him. And, you know, we, you know, I'm watching the the monitor, the heart monitor. And you just see, you you hear it because it's not the beep. It's like the beeps are, the nurse comes in and she goes, you know, it's time. So we both were holding him and we were like, it's, you know, we're okay. We're going to be okay. And he left and we were just holding him and it was just me and my sister exactly how we would have wanted it, you know? And, uh, you know, he passed and it was just, you know, and you never expect to like, you know, lose your dad at such a young age. And it's like, you know, it's just been really hard and, you know, it's like five years now and it doesn't get easier. Mm-hmm. You know, you just learn to, to deal and, you know, it's like moments like, you know, like we, I got married two years ago and, you know, I wish my husband could have met my dad. And, you know, when you have kids and we're having babies and, you know, you want them to have a granddad and it's just like those moments, it's hard, you know, mm-hmm. um, but then you just try to remind yourself of all the memories and all the amazing memories you have. And it's just this disease so it's just like you know mm-hmm. it's devastating and the way it takes somebody like that and I just you know I think what you're doing with it is so amazing <laughs> not a lot of people realize and understand how bad this disease is so I'm I thank you for letting me talk about him and tell his story yeah you know thank you for sharing as well you know it's not <laughs> sorry it's, no oh my god it no it doesn't get easier like I said you still yeah it's you know. also I think well, you mentioned that his five-year anniversary was just a couple mm-hmm. weeks ago. Yeah. So how did you feel, like, coming across, like, like it's, it's crazy to think about. Because also, like, again, like, you know, we talked about, like, my father passed away, like, two months after yours did. Mm-hmm. And it's, like, the two-week anniversary, or sorry, the five-year five, five anniversary is in two weeks, which is insane. Yeah. And so, like, like, how do you feel, like, that you just passed that anniversary? You know, like, I was telling you earlier, I just feel like... It doesn't get easier, but you just learn to deal with it and you learn to like on that day, I just try and like look at old photos and like, you know, listen to Tom Petty and the Beatles and like listen because that like Tom Petty in that I don't know if like you have felt like this with your dad or like had something like where whenever I hear Tom Petty, I know that's my dad. Like Mm -hmm. and it it plays at the most craziest times where it's like. I'm thinking about him or or there, it's a significant day or something and the Tom Petty song comes on. I'm just like, hi, dad. Like that. Mm-hmm. that's where, you know, it's like that's our thing. And I feel like, though, you know, those little moments are what keep you going. Biodexa Pharmaceuticals is proud to sponsor the glioblastoma, a.k.a. GBM podcast. Biodexa Pharmaceuticals is a small biotechnology company hoping to make a big difference in the treatment of glioblastoma. Using their proprietary nanotechnology, Biodexa is developing liquid formulations of an investigational drug which can be delivered directly and locally into the tumor via an implanted catheter. This drug has been previously investigated in pediatric patients with brain tumors. Biodexa Pharmaceuticals is currently running a clinical trial in patients with recurrent glioblastoma known as the MAGIC G1 trial. To find out more about the MAGIC trial, visit magictrials.com. Imagine waking up from brain tumor removal surgery knowing that your radiation treatment is already underway. That's how gametile therapy works. At the end of brain tumor removal surgery, the neurosurgeon implants the gametiles where the tumor is most likely to return. So instead of waiting to start daily standard radiation treatments that go for weeks, you get a head start against tumor cells and get back to your life sooner. For operable brain tumors of all types, including glioblastomas, brain metastases, menginomas, Gametile therapy is a one-time, targeted radiation treatment with fewer side effects and a far less chance of hair loss than external radiation. Gametile therapy is tough on tumors and easier on patients and caregivers. Learn more at gametile.com. 
gamma therapy is an FDA-cleared radiation therapy for patients with newly diagnosed malignant brain tumors and recurrent brain tumors. Novacure is pleased to support the glioblastoma, aka GBM, podcast. Novacure strives to extend survival in some of the most aggressive forms of cancer through the development and commercialization of their innovative therapy called tumor treating fields. Novacure partners with the glioblastoma research organization to work together on behalf of patients and their loved ones impacted by GBM. To learn more, visit novacure.com. Ruin was built by a team of patients, caregivers, and medical experts, consisting of neurosurgeons, neuro-oncologists, psycho-oncologists, radiation oncologists, nurse practitioners, and social workers who have devoted their lives to treating and helping glioblastoma patients. For anyone navigating GBM, Rune offers a wealth of medically vetted digestible video answers to common questions. Answers are organized into major topics ranging from surgery to radiation to caregiver mental health. Check it out at rune.com. I think for me it's not so much music but more so like whenever I see a crow, like I've talked about it on the show in the past because like my dad used to like walk my dog down this one street and there was like this crow, like this is just black, random black crow would attack his head every day. <laughs> just like he'd walk, come home from like walking my dog and had like blood on his head. I was like, are you good? Like what happened? And he's like, yeah, crow just attacked me. And like the same crow would attack him every day. And so whenever I see a crow, I'm like, what's up? Like that's my dad. Exactly. That's it's like cool. It's like nice little reminders for sure. Totally. But it's, yeah. It's, it's crazy. It's almost five years. Yeah. I mean the five year and I just, you know. I feel like time has really gone by like really fast when I think about it too. I'm like, I can't even believe it's been five years. When you met your now husband, like were you looking, obviously I think there's like this thing in society where women tend to like, even like men, but like, you know, you tend to like romantically go for someone that's similar to a parent. Like, Mm -hmm. do you find similarities in your dad and your now husband? I do. I do. I feel like my dad was like a very like introvert. He liked to play golf. And then he just loved to like chill on the couch and mm-hmm. watch golf. Like he was a very That's like all my dad simple, did also. That's yeah, so crazy. Like, <laughs> he was just very chill, mm-hmm. you know. And my husband, same way, very chill. Kind of a, before he met me, was introvert. Like was just good with his dog and like, mm-hmm. you know, go to work and yeah. He and they're just very similar. Like my husband's very chill. Like he has his hobbies he likes to do. But yeah, you do. It's I think that's very true. Mm-hmm. I do see a lot in, in when him. you when you went through like your wedding. Obviously, I'm sure that's super hard without your dad because it's something yeah. that I think about. It's like mm-hmm. you know those milestones of life. Like how did you get through that? And like what was going through your head like on your wedding day without your dad? Gosh, you know, well, my husband lost his dad too. Actually, I think around the same the same exact time my dad oh, passed wow. five years ago. And so we have that, you know, and I knew like when we were planning our wedding, we both were like, you know, it'd be really cool if we had like chairs reserved for them mm-hmm. with their names on it, like little plaques, you know, and right in the front. I was like, I love that idea. And we had them right next to like his mom and my mom right in the front. And I remember when I was having to like figure out how I wanted to walk down the aisle I was like, I don't want to feel like I'm replacing my dad. Mm -hmm. Like, I want to just walk down the aisle by myself. Oh, wow. Like, I feel like this is my time. Like, I'm walking into my life with my husband, and I don't want to replace my dad. Mm -hmm. I want to walk down that aisle by myself. And I think it really made a statement to, like, okay, this is, like, you know, her walking into her new life. And, like, I just it just felt right. Mm -hmm. It felt like I don't want to replace him. I just want to, you know... I don't know. I don't, I just felt that I needed to do that. And Mm -hmm. even when we did our dance, I had my mom, me and my mom did our, you know, mother daughter dance. Mm -hmm. And, um, I danced with, uh, my husband's dad or stepdad and, you know, throughout the wedding, you know, we, it was talked about in the speeches and, and we talked about our dads and stuff. And, you know, that was really hard. It was hard. And it's just, you just figure out how to get through it. You know, there was moments like it was really cool. My wedding dress designers, they didn't tell me they were doing this. My best friend um, had helped them do it. So the day of the the wedding, I go to open the dress and it says right in right here. It was like forever, you know, always with you, Ronald. 
That's my dad's name. And mm-hmm. I was just like, oh my gosh. And I was like bawling. And I'm like, this is not. And my makeup artist is like, oh my God, no. We just spent four hours. And I was like, oh my God. And I was like, okay, okay, hold it in. You know, and my mom was sitting there when, and she was just like, oh my God. And so it was just such a cool moment to have that, you know? Yeah. So, and that's, that's super special. And it's something that I definitely think about a lot. Cause like, you know. My love life is nowhere near that. <laughs> but <laughs> You'll I'm get there. Like, what happens like one day? Like, what am I going to do? And like, I'm like, do I even like want a wedding? But I'm like, yes. And then no, it's like, I think it's, yeah. I, I, everyone's different, but I think that's really like beautiful. Like what you did about like with the seats and like, obviously like the wedding dresses, I'm sure is super special. Yeah. It's just those, you want to put those little touches in, you know? Yeah. Just try and, and make, you know, it known and, and him known and did you find that any of your friends were maybe like uncomfortable with the topic of death because obviously your father had passed away Mm -hmm. and I'm sure it was a hard day for you like how did the people in your life sort of deal with that you know I have amazing friends and they really really rallied behind me and I don't know what I would have done without them honestly because all my family again it's on the east coast in Florida and you know all I have in LA were my girlfriends and they were there and when I came home they were there every day you know, with me ordering food, staying the night with me, you know, taking turns, whoever could, you know, be there. And uh, luckily I, I was very close, like a few streets down from like my best friend, my maid of honor. She really was, I don't know what I would have done without her. Like she was my godsend at that time. So mm-hmm. they were, they were fine with the death. I think they, they didn't really know what to do or how to, I think they just were like, we're just, we love you and we're going to do whatever we can. Like you're going to get through this. Mm-hmm. And yeah, then you're doing, you're here. We're here. We're here. How do you feel like the grief process has been with you so far? Because I think also, like me, you also co founded a nonprofit, Mm -hmm. and which I I get this comment a lot that it's like not the most common route to take when you're grieving. Like, you can, people will support, but you're not right. Most people aren't like starting their own organization. So, like, why did you start your own organization? And like, how'd you? get involved you know when when we started me and my sister started talking about it and like being vocal about what happened we had a lot of people reach out a lot of people that were like oh my gosh I've had family members pass oh my thank you so much for talking about this like Mm -hmm. this is not known this is not a known disease it's not a known cancer nobody talks about this and I was just like oh this is like this and the same like when I talked about my IVF journey and you have women that are like oh my god like thank you so much like Social media has really done such good things when it comes to like being out and being open about about stuff like that. And it really like helped me a lot when I was grieving my dad and like having people reach out. And so one of the people who reached out was this guy, Sean, who he's the one who actually started Cure Glioblastoma. Mm-hmm. But he wanted um, a co-founder and, you know, somebody who with a good following and like a name and approached me. And I was like, um, yes, like this, I, I was like, I feel like I have my chance to like advocate for my dad because I'd wanted to do something to like bring awareness and advocate for him because I feel like when he passed, like, you know, we could have, we could have sued the hospitals. We could for misdiagnosing him so many times. Like there's so many things like, but when you look at it, you're like, I'm 30 years old. My sister's 28 years old. Like the last thing we're going to do is like go in courtrooms and try and fight for years. Like, mm-hmm. for, you know what I mean? It's just like never ending battle. Mm -hmm. And so we just were like, let's not do that, but like figure out how we can, what we can do to advocate for dad. And so when this opportunity approached, I was like, yes, like I would love to be a part of it. And you know, it was great. Like, but the really bad part about it was it happened when, right when COVID was hitting and we had these big plans. We're going to do these big parties and like, I know Sean was telling me social media (laughs) events. And then it was like COVID and And that was, you know, it kind of really put a hold on everything for the last few years. You know, I tried to do as much as I could and talk about it, but it was like, we're going through COVID, you know, so people are losing their lives through COVID. And it was just like, oh, you know, not the right time. And now I feel like ever like that's kind of subsided. And, you know, now we can get back into what we, you know, started from the beginning. So, yeah. What do you feel like? is different obviously you know aside from your father but like how do you feel your life has changed before glioblastoma versus afterwards you know I I feel like in a lot of ways like I said before I had no idea about this cancer I didn't even and I knew cancer ran in my dad's family it's you know we're Ashkenazi Jewish like Mm -hmm. we have you know all of really yeah high five five, sister (laughs) as we miss (laughs) um (laughs) 
<laughs> so, you know, I knew that that could happen. Like my dad, I think his dad passed away of like lung cancer. And, mm -hmm. you know, I just, you know, all of his family has passed from a certain type of cancer. And so I just, you know, you don't, you, nothing can prepare you mm -hmm. for it. And I feel like before I just like, it's like my dad's invincible. Like he's going to live forever. Like you just don't think about that. And mm -hmm. it just, you know, you, you think about, okay. Cause I have my, my grandma, my mom's side is like 90 years old. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he was like not going anywhere anytime soon. Mm -hmm. And so you just picture like your mother and your father living till they're like 90, a hundred years old. So my dad was 66 and it was just like, Wait, really? Yeah. My dad was 66. Stop. That's fucking crazy. Girl, this is wild. That's <laughs> nuts. That's wild. Wait, that's crazy. That really is. That's oh my like God. Whoa. crazy. <laughs> um, so you get it. Like, yeah. They're so young. And mm -hmm. I mean, you know, nothing can prepare you for it. And mm -hmm. once it happens, it's just like, and when I did all my, I did so much research after my dad passed on glioblastoma. And I was just like, how is this not talked about? Like, mm -hmm. how is this cancer not spoken like because of how severe it is it it takes you so fast and I'm just and it was just like this needs to be put blasted everywhere like mm -hmm. I want to talk about this as much as possible and bring awareness to this because it is just such a insane rare cancer that and a lot of doctors don't want to like deal like they took two months to do a brain biopsy on my dad. Like they just, it's just insane to me how these doctors and this healthcare system, and it's sad that I'm like bashing them, but it really, like they really don't, mm -hmm. they don't really, I mean, you're a number. And seeing that firsthand, I was just like, if any, like my family or friends like ever go, like I will be fighting for them, you mm -hmm. know? And so I just feel like it really taught me and really like, you know, made me aware of like cancer is, it's, I th it's a big deal, yeah. you know, and it's not something that like people can brush off and, you know, and it, it, it's scary for me and my sister because cancer does run in our family. So did obviously, you get any testing done as soon as I your did. dad was diagnosed? Okay. I, I did, did it. I did also. I did it before I did it when I was like 20. My mom oh. was like, oh, she was like, I want to make sure you guys don't have like breast cancer mm -hmm. gene, ovarian cancer gene. Like, you know, we need to just make sure. So we did all the testing. I'm and I'm good. I'm golden. So mm -hmm. that's great. But you know, it's still, still scary for sure. Yeah. Is there any particular advice you'd give to any, anyone, especially like a daughter that's in your position where you were, when you found out your dad was diagnosed? Oh, um, yes, there's so many, you know, I wish I had somebody to talk to when I was going through it, who, who knew what to prepare me for and mm -hmm. my because we didn't know what we were prepared like we didn't know what to prepare for we had no idea any how fast this was going to take him what we were going to have to go through like so if I have any advice to give to somebody who is in my position is just like just be in there with them with your dad or your mother or family member every day just Regardless if, if they aren't talking or they aren't moving or speaking, just being there with them, you mm -hmm. know, that's what's getting them through every day. And like just talking with them and, and making them feel like they're not alone mm -hmm. and they're and you're by their side because at the end of the day, there's nothing you can do, you know, and you just have to be there and just cherish those moments mm -hmm. because you don't know how long they're going to last. And just, you know, it doesn't get easier, but it time does heal all, you know but it's, it's hard. And I'm, I just cherish the times that I was able to be there for him every day, fighting for him. And yeah. Is there any particular lesson or something that your dad taught you that you want to teach your baby, <laughs> your upcoming <laughs> <Yes>. babies? <laughs> um, yeah, my dad was very, he was you know, and my mom, he was so all about me and my sister. Like we were his everything. Mm -hmm. I just, you know, I want to do obviously the same for my kids. And he was just our like everything. Like whenever we would get in trouble, like we would call our dad because he was like, I got you. Don't worry. Like mm -hmm. my mom was the disciplinary. My dad was like, I'll take care of you. Don't worry. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, which probably at the end of the day, you know, poor mom, she was like the bad guy all the time. But 
Um, he just was our number one fan. He was our number one fan and supported us in whatever we did. Never questioned, never was like, mm, I don't know. He just was our number one fan. And, and I want to instill that in my babies. Like, I'm your number one fan and whatever you want to do, I support no matter what. That's amazing. Well, thank you. thank you for sharing your story and being vulnerable. And it's such a pleasure to finally meet you. Yes, you too. It's crazy how much we have in so common. Much. I literally I didn't know, know half these things. Like I'm sitting here like... She said, what? Her dad was how old? And she's doing it. It's like, I feel like this is meant to be. Like, I'm so glad, you know, you had me on. Yes. So. Oh, thank you so much. Thank it was such you. a pleasure. And I hope everyone will enjoy this as much as I did. Me too. Thank you. That's a wrap. That's it for this week's show. Thank you so much for tuning in again to another episode of Glioblastoma, a.k.a. GBM. To get in touch with our organization, Visit us online at gbmresearch.org or visit us on Instagram or Facebook at glioblastoma research. Visit us on Twitter at glioblastoma.org or visit us on LinkedIn at glioblastoma research organization. To make a donation to the organization, which is fully tax deductible, visit us online at gbmresearch.org where you can designate your donation in honor of someone or find other methods that you can make a donation with. Thank you again for supporting us, for supporting the show, and we'll see you next week. Welcome back to another deep dive with Stash Strong. Today, let's talk about this episode with Barbie Blank. I personally, you know, it was exactly in her in her shoes, but I think it's interesting to hear your thoughts because she talks about her sibling in that situation, although they were dealing with their dad's diagnosis. I mean, I resonate a lot, which we can go into in a second, yeah. but I would love to hear like your feedback on the, the episode. Yeah, I thought her perspective right, of her and her sister doing a lot for her dad kind of was like my sister and I, right? Mm -hmm. um, in the sense that we, we didn't live in the same city, Cal and I. Everyone had different roles at different times, but like the important thing is we were always there, Yeah. right? And I think also her, her just general vulnerability and emotion in that episode, even years later, show the impact of this disease, right? And, and as they talk through, you know, I think early on her sister, Barbie's sister, was was living with her her dad, and then she was in and out from shows and stuff and, and events, and I think it, it was a really good picture to show how much moves mm -hmm. and changes and is dynamic when, when you're trying to care for your loved one because, again, they were at a very similar age that I was at, right, uh, late 20s. You're trying to live your life. Right, you, you have again. You take that pre gmm moment. You have an entire life ahead of you. Mm -hmm. Things change on a dime, and now you're balancing that with what for her and also for me, like our number ones, right? Yeah. Um, and so Kelly and I, as siblings, were balancing again our, our early to mid twenties life, taking care of my brother, being there with him always, and, and also again trying to make sure that we were moving forward in the same way. So I thought the way that she kind of described that was super helpful because I, I, again, I could see as she was talking to things in and out of cities and traveling, I, I could see us doing that because that mm -hmm. was happening while my brother was diagnosed. Yeah. I think it's an interesting perspective too, because I talked to a lot of people through the organization um, in all walks of life. You know, you could be parents that have lost your child, or you mm -hmm. can be someone that has brain cancer, or you can be someone, you know, like a sibling. But I find that there's not many daughters that I've talked to. Hmm. And I found, I found, you know, Barbie's perspective really interesting because it just, it's so wild when you compare your GBM story to someone else's, how many similarities there are, you know, every patient's mm -hmm. different, they all go through different things, but there's this like very similar constant like trend of emotions and feelings and like heaviness and situations you deal with as like a daughter, especially and like things you think about. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was really interesting. And, you know, also she mentioned how she got married after her father had passed away and how they like, you know, they honored, like they did a special thing to honor that. And that kind of like makes me think about like my future. So it's definitely interesting to hear about her perspective because like I kind of view her like an older sister because mm -hmm. you know she's a couple years older than me, but she's starting to now do all these things that like you know probably in my you know X amount of whatever that I'll probably start doing. So like it's it's things to think about, and it's also just nice to hear her perspective, like you know how she dealt with with getting married without her father, which are like things that I think about sometimes yeah. too. So it's it's it was an interesting episode, and I think it was also really cool to hear her perspective because she hasn't necessarily shared it public. And her and I talked about it on the episode too, that she hasn't necessarily like 
shared her mm-hmm. full story with glioblastoma. So I always think it's fascinating to get to know someone and what they actually went through. And, you know, because, you, you you know, people can write something on Instagram or you can see a social version of what someone mm-hmm. looks like. And I do say a lot of the time that, like, Instagram is, like, a highlight reel. But, like, I think what's so special about like, the podcast is you can kind of, like, get, like, one-on-one and sort yeah. of understand someone's perspective and an actual, like, under you know connect with them so i was really happy to have her on it was just like an awesome i think it was a great episode it was, it was super eye opening yeah. yeah and it, it's interesting that the wedding part resonated with you it resonated with me as well right mm-hmm. like my brother would be my best man right right and he should be speaking and cracking jokes that you know i was the annoying little brother and mm-hmm. um all those things on, on my wedding day next year and that won't be there right and and as we've gone through this i'm starting to ask my groomsmen to be in my wedding, like a really important thing for me to ask my best friends to like be there on my day. Mm -hmm. And I like have this little feeling in the back of my mind every time I do it, it's just like, damn, like I I don't get to ask my brother. I knew that the second he passed, right? Like that's something I I spoke about it during- But it's hard. It's hard, right? Like I, and and I know, and it's difficult. And I, uh, when she said it, it's like, you know that your dad's not gonna, she knew her dad was gonna be there on a wedding day, right? Because he had passed Mm -hmm. by the time she had gotten engaged and you know it leading up to it, but like when it hits, she said it was like it, it, that moment felt it's intense. And intense, right? And yeah. I, I, it's something that I am going through now. So many people go through a GBM. How right? are Again. you dealing with it now? Um, it's probably one of the most difficult things lately mm-hmm. um, because it's the first time there's a true miss right. in the sense of, you know, normal vacations and trips and, you know, camaraderie like all oh, that's gone my sister and i haven't got married we haven't had kids right like there's no there's been no like monumental moment in our mm-hmm. you know four five person family that he like truly hasn't been out outside of holidays and things that are going to happen every year mm-hmm. so you know for me it's difficult because i know that day is going to come and there's going to be an elephant in the room there's going to be a huge personality that is probably one of the most important on that day outside of my future wife mm-hmm. um that won't be there and, and that to me is something like i think about that a lot right and you know, like my cousins will be our be my best man, and the three of us, uh, we were both his best man, right? Like it was kind of this this trio always. Mm-hmm. And I also think about like that's going to be very difficult for him. I shouldn't be thinking about all the all of these things, but, but you, it's you, it's you, real. You totally can. It's, there's no yeah. reason you there's no reason you shouldn't be thinking. About yeah, it. The, totally. There's no right or wrong. Totally. And I, I I guess what I'm saying, I've never actually said this out loud, right? Mm-hmm. Like these are things that I talk about with my fiance, with my parents, with my sister. But like, that's a huge void Mm -hmm. that because of GBM, like I'm, I'm going to lose out on. Right. Mm -hmm. And even vice versa. Like I, I should be able to, like the first time I got to really publicly, I I said, I I gave my brother's eulogy. Like that's a day where just, I mean, my goodness, but it was the best man speech for me. Yeah. And, And it broke my heart that my best man speech, my brother was at his funeral. Right. And, And so, you know, again, going in circles here, but that's, Something that, as Barbie said, that I was like, gosh, mm-hmm. I, I, I listened to it this afternoon, <laughs> right? Yeah. And I, I was just like, man, I get that. Again, I don't get it. I haven't lost my parent, but like my brother was, is that part for me that I won't have on, on a big day. And again, yeah. there's going to be a lot more holidays and he won't be an uncle, right? For my sister and I, and he won't be, uh, he won't get to be a husband. You know, so many things that were taken away at, a, at an early age that, that make it difficult to, to process. Yeah, I'm sure. And, and especially for me with my father as well. But I think it's also, I try not necessarily to not only think about the negatives. And, like, there are positives. Like, I very, like, much believe that, like, my dad, it's like his energy is still Mm -hmm. here. And, like, I'm sure same for your brother, right? So it's, I don't want any, you know, necessarily, let's say, a patient's listening to this and to be, like, really upset hearing us talk about this. But, like, there there are still positives that I think about, too. It's like, you know, I still feel, like, my dad's energy. And, like, there are still, like, ways that he'll be with me. Like, I'm sure your brother will still be Mm -hmm. with you in, in whatever way, shape, or form that you decide to honor him during that milestone of your life. And so while there are some, you know, significantly upsetting parts about losing someone to glioblastoma, whatever relation that they may be to you, we're still getting through it yeah. and every we're okay. And that there are still positives to think about and there are still ways that, you know, that you can honor someone and have someone that you love like with you and, and be okay. Yeah, every time my brother's name gets mentioned, I smile. That's just like naturally what I still do. Like I, yeah. I, I miss him, but like I am always so fortunate to have had an abundance of strong memories and, and again, a brother that's really a best friend. So like, as I talk through these things, it's also one of those, how lucky I am, right? right? To have, you know, something be so difficult to miss. I'll also say, you know, in a given day, 
I, I love to talk about my brother and, and I smile when I hear, you know, his name and, and get to talk about him to new people, right? right? I get the opportunity for someone who never met my brother to leave a conversation and feel like they knew my brother. Right. I love that. That's pretty powerful. Well, thank you for sharing your story and being vulnerable. And, you know, I think what you said or what we both said just now will resonate with a lot of people. And um, like we've said in other segments that Colin and I understand this very well. I, from a daughter perspective, Colin, from a brother perspective. So if anyone has any questions, any ways, you know, any advice, support needed, if you're going through any particular milestone, like we get it, we're here for you. And yeah, we're all, we're all in this together. So we appreciate everyone listening. And thank you for joining us on another segment of Deep Dive with Staff Strong.